culture, I went through Ajax samples from the file system. And that didn't work. I actually had to go live against Ditel's web server. And if you guys watch the video lecture, you'll see that I had to go to the live web server in Ditel's.com. Tonight, I'm going to do against my local Apache web server. Okay? But you guys should know the concept behind Ajax by now. If you don't, or there's any questions about it, please ask. You guys are going to have to do your login. That means the username and password that your users key in, you guys have to do the login using Ajax. Okay? All right. So at this point, I'm assuming that you guys already have some kind of LAMP or WAMP stack installed, that you know how to do that. So I am going to use it in my Eclipse. So I launch my Eclipse. Here it is. I have week seven samples. Here they are. These are the examples that use Ajax. Those samples, week seven samples, come from the book. I have created a project in Eclipse using those and I have provided them to you right here. So please, if you haven't done so already, download them, import them to Eclipse, try them. So I launched my WAMP server. Here it is, it's red. That means neither one, now it's orange. Only one of the servers is up. And it's green. Both services are up. Okay? So now, that means I can go into my browser and hit it. Localhost. Here I am. This is my WAMP server. Okay? As I explained when I downloaded the WAMP server and installed it, you will get to see all the projects that are being deployed into your web server. Okay? So in my case, I have these two projects. This one you guys should be familiar with, Timex Web. This is what I get, the contents of the directory. If I go into web content, then I get index.html rendered. This is my Timex Web running in my Apache web server. And I'm not going to go through it all over again because I already did that when I downloaded WAMP and explained how to install it and all that stuff. So you guys should already know. Okay? But my project is now running under Apache Web Server. Now, what if I just want, what if I just want to be able to run my Apache web server with an Eclipse? And it's a valid question. Let me, let me tell you why it's a valid question. Because from here on, you guys will be developing your website using Eclipse. 
Eclipse has intelligence, so it knows everything that you need to know about PHP, about HTML, about cascading style sheets. It will help you. In fact, within Eclipse, you will be able to debug your website step by step. You can run through your PHP code and see exactly what it's doing. Notepad will not give you that. WAMP will not give you that. Okay? So you need to be able to develop. That means write code and debug and test your website using Eclipse. So you need your Eclipse, I mean your Apache inside Eclipse. Okay? So how do you do that? <coughs> We're going to use the same Apache web server that came installed with WAMP. For now, I'm just going to stop my Apache service. So now it's orange, which means my Apache is down, my MySQL database server is up. And I'm going to tell Eclipse. Eclipse has, at least under the web or PHP perspectives, or not the PHP perspective, but the web perspective, it has a tab on the bottom called servers. This is where you declare your servers, where you can tell, hey Eclipse, I want you to talk to, and you tell what web server you're going to be using. So, in here, <coughs> this is where you're going to create a new server. So you right click on it, new server. And right now there's nothing to choose because we don't have any any server adapters yet. So we have to declare our Apache web server adapter. So how do we do that? I'm going to cancel that. And I'm going to Okay. So we're going to have to go into the check for uh, no, install new software. And uh, I believe this is Helios. stuff JavaScript development tools <coughs> that's as far as the web development as far as programming languages make sure that you are going to install the PHP development tools this is all the stuff that you guys will have to do in order to get your Eclipse ready for PHP and Apache as well. General purpose tools. Uh, nope. Eclipse target platform database development. Yep, you might want to do the database development so you can communicate with your MySQL as well with an Eclipse. Uh, Linux tools, mobile devices, modeling. I think that's about it. Okay. So under the web... You want the Eclipse web developer tools. 
You want the JavaScript development tools. You want the PHP development tools. You want the Ajax. You want the page editor. Oh, thank you for <laughs> making me go back. WST server adapters. And it's going to download all that stuff, install it, and you have to reboot your Eclipse, and you got it. All right, while it's doing all this stuff, <coughs> I'm going to redo the Ajax samples that I did two weeks ago. Okay? one or two weeks ago, the Ajax samples that I did from the file system, I'm going to do them now from my Apache web server. So if you guys remember, where do I have all my projects? Anybody remembers? Nope. I still have them on their sites, right? On their sites, I have a CSIS 3020 week 7 right and this one all these guys are the Ajax samples that I covered that day from the file system and like I said they didn't work because there wasn't a true web server replying so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that and deploy it into my Apache web server. And where is my Apache web server? It's under WAMP. It's under www. And I'm going to paste it there. Okay? Now I have CSIS 3020 week 7 in there. Okay? So now, if I go into my WAMP server and start my Apache service, it's going to go from orange to green, which means both services are up. And I'm going to hit it again. And refresh. Now, what do you see? three projects deployed. Okay? So I go into the CIS 3020 project, web content, and I'm going to select, if you guys remember, it's a uh, switch content. Yeah, that's the one, switch content. Okay? So now notice that when you hover any one of the images, just when you hover, description of what that book is about comes up. See that? This is Ajax in action asynchronous Java script and XML Ajax well I do have a question why is it that when I tried that same switch content HTML from the file system it doesn't work what happens in this case what's different it's not being served by by the server so that means that every time that I hover any one of these images there is an HTTP 
request to the server. The server goes and finds whatever is it that it's, I'm asking him to do, and he comes back with an answer. And the answer is the stuff that gets put in here. That will not work in the file system. It will only work on a web server. Now, some other really cool tool that I want you guys to look at, or learn to use, is Firebug. With Firebug, you can actually detect what's going behind the scenes that you don't know about, including any AJAX calls. So if you go into your net, and you make sure that you enabled the net, okay? Oops! Did you guys see when I went into the fourth one that I got a request? You missed that? Okay, I'm going to try it again. This is the first one. Second one. Third one. Fourth one. Now notice when I go into the fifth one. Uh, another request. Do you guys understand what's going on here? Yes! Now, tell me why is it that you don't understand what I'm doing right now. Honestly, did you watch the Ajax video lecture? If an Ajax call is a request to the server, that means that on its own, without me have to type a URL in the in the browser and hit and enter so that it goes to the server and brings back something. If the Ajax is that what it's doing, somehow i got to be able to find out what kind of request it's doing. This is exactly what I'm pointing at. One, two, three, four. I'm not getting any requests now. Why? There you go. Ajax is smart enough to say, you know what, let me see if it's in the cache. Oh no, it's not in the cache. I'm going to do the request to the server. Next time, when he cuts back the answer, next time when you ask for the same thing, it's going to go and look in the cache. It's going to find it. You won't do the request to the server. So it has to be smart enough so you don't bombard your server with a whole bunch of requests when you already have your answer locally. Okay? That's why you're not getting any new requests on the fourth one, the fifth one. But now, notice what happens when I go into the sixth one. Oop, I guess I already had it cached. So let me refresh my page. And now they're all cached. So now what I have to do is I have to go into my history, clear recent history for the last hour, clear absolutely everything, forget that I went there, it will clear cookies, cache, doesn't have to clear all that stuff, but refresh the page. And you see all those requests. Right. So what are these requests? Let's take a look at the last one. These are the headers of the request. Can you explain to me what the header is of the request? basically the part that you tell the web server what it's expecting to 
come back, right? So I'm expecting any one of these, right? And what else? From this guy. And in fact, this is the document that I want. Or that I am in. I'm sorry. The document that I'm in. It's called a refer. And this is the type of operating system and browser that is asking for it. The web server is getting all this data from you. In fact, from your browser. Okay? So let's take a look at the response of this get. Get cppht.p6.html. What was the response? HTML. And in fact, if you look at the HTML, it doesn't have a header, it doesn't have a title. It just has a body, a div in the body that says C++ How to Program 7th Edition. Guess what? This stuff is what shows in here. You guys see that? Okay. Let's clear it. So that's the reason why Ajax now works locally on my computer. But obviously it will still not work from the file system. Arguments? Parameters, you mean? Yes, the whole URL. The whole URL that you pass will get stored. And the response, obviously. If you change anything in the URL, a parameter, an extension, a folder, whatever, it's a different request. Just onto page. Okay. And we're going to activate the network. Right now, it just has the get pool images onto page HTML. What do you get back? You get back a body with one, two, three, four, five, six input boxes. They're all of the type radio buttons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Every time that I change something in my project, am I going to have to go and deploy it back all over again to, a, to a Apache Web Server? The answer is no if you have your Apache Web Server locally on your Eclipse. And yes, if you have it under your WAMP server. That's another reason why you want your Apache Web Server within Eclipse. We should have... Yep, here it is. So when I do a right-click new server under the Servers tab, now you see an HTTP preview and an HTTP server. You want the HTTP server. Okay. Next. You can call it, I don't know, Apache. In fact, I think it's Apache... Two point two point twenty one. Okay, you can call it whatever you want, 
and then you have to tell it where is the publishing directory where is the publishing directory that's the www that I copy my CSIS uh, week 7 into so you have to tell it it's you're gonna find it in my computer under my C drive under WAMP under www that's the publishing directory you click OK next what's gonna be the port the HTTP port that it will listen to WAMP will default to 80 okay you can change that in the configuration if you want but it will default to 80 and there's no URL prefix next now what is it you want me to run under that new server what do you want me to deploy this is the equivalent to deploying I want you to deploy this guy now before I deploy it ah remember localhost is nothing else than a name for a very particular IP address and this particular IP address is called the loopback IP address it's 127.0.0.1 it's the only IP address that will say you know what don't go out there looking for somebody just it's locally okay so it's not going to go out on the internet looking for somebody called localhost okay like when you go to nova.edu okay there's going to be a server somewhere in somewhere in the day in the uh, internet that is going to say oh you're looking for nova.edu that means that the IP address that you want and I don't know what Noah's IP address is very quickly let's ping www.nova.edu it's oh the IP address that you want is 137.52.130.45 now tell me which one is e much easier to remember Nova.edu or 137.52.130.45 hence the existence of domain name servers they're just a phone book for the internet you want Nova? this is the IP that you have to go to you want Yahoo? this is the IP that you have to go to domain name server localhost doesn't need that but localhost is going to look for a service on the computer listening through port 80 it's going to look for it and it's going to send whatever folder document I'm asking for it okay so in this case what am I asking I'm asking for CSIS 3020 week 7 do I have that what do you guys think do I have that I do what else is going to ask for web content do I have that yes I have that what else pull images onto page.html this guy okay this guy so let's hit it refresh yeah I did it so let me try the other one to go to so when you go to switch content yep you were right so you have to have that Apache service up 
and then I change something on the pool images. Save it. Mm. And then refresh. Nope. Somehow there's a disconnect here. Oh wait, it just synchronized it. It was republishing and it just synchronized it. Yep. Okay. So it's gonna it's gonna wait a little bit, you know, it's gonna be like a delay. And I think that's config configurable somewhere in the Eclipse, where you can actually say how long to wait before deploying. Somewhere is the configuration that says, you know, how long to wait. So when you change something, when you change something in the code, and you save it, notice down there, it says republish you wait a little and it should come back to synchronize when it's synchronized that means it got your changes now you can manually if you don't want to wait you can manually say um, publish you right click on the server and you publish and it will take all that stuff and force it to be published <coughs> so now it says none so now the Ajax for this guy should work so when I click on Java I only get the Java books C and C++ when I do the .NET I only get the .NET books when I do how to program, I get the how to program books. Or the simply. And you get the point. With this one, you get all the books. So, does that mean that I cannot hit it from here anymore? What do you guys think? So I should be able to, right? So let's do a refresh. Yep. It does. So you guys want to see what's the effect of clicking on Simply Books? It does four requests to the server. Clicking on this guy does four requests to the server. Can anybody explain to me why is it for? Three images, very good, and simply dot XML. What is that? Look at this. I already cover XML about three or four weeks ago. This is the document that you get back. It's an XML document that says these are the following covers. And you are given three covers. Right? Each cover has an image and a title. Can you tell me how I extract the image and the title so I can show it? Hmm? Where would I find that stuff? I want to know if I'm getting three pictures and an XML, how on earth am I showing those three pictures in there? How do I know that I have to show apparently a table of three pictures 
One called Simple CPP, another one Simple VB2005, another one Simple Java. How? I mean, obviously the answer is going to come from here, right? Because this is the response from my Ajax call. What do you guys think? Who has the answer? Where is the Ajax call originating from? From where? From the HTML document. How about if we go there and find the answer? I don't know where to look, so I'm just going to point to this guy and it's going to show me this is an image created. This is the other image created, and this is the other image created. So I was right, it's a table. Guys, see that? It's a table under a div. What's the name of the div? Covers. Somewhere's got to be a reference to covers. How about if we searched for it? No. In fact, <coughs> allow me to do this. Refresh the page. Nothing has been selected. Right? And I'm going to inspect it. I'm going to inspect this. What's under ID covers? <coughs> What's under the diff whose ID is covers? Empty. There's nothing in there. But when I click on the radio button, simply books, that triggers an Ajax call to the server that asks for simply.xml comes back with that answer right and then I say oh I have to get this book this book and this book and then there's three more Ajax calls for the images of those three books once I get that I fabricate the HTML image href to this image and all that stuff who is doing all that work? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the guy that is doing all the work. It's called JavaScript. Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Here it is. A function get images. Ah, what did I do with it? A function call get images. What else? Another function call process response. What else? Another function call clear table. Ah, when you click on this radio button, it's going to execute on the unclick of it, you're going to execute get images. And you pass an XML request. So when I click on the radio button that says simply books, it's going to execute get images of what? You pass us a parameter simply that XML. Exactly. The name. That's why it's a string. So let's analyze. Let's analyze get images. Get images is a JavaScript function and that simply XML we're gonna call it URL. It's a variable. It's a parameter.
right? What do I do? Look at this. This is the famous one. This guy is called the XML HTTP request. This guy is the object in charge of doing all the AJAX calls to the server. It's an object that lives on your browser that you can access to it using JavaScript. Okay? That's the guy that does the AJAX calls for you. And what do you do? You create a new instance of it and you call it async request. You can call it whatever you want. Peter, Paul, whatever. It's a variable. It's an instance of that object. And then what do you do? And I went through this two weeks ago, guys. I went through each one of these steps. What do you do? You say, hey object or Ajax object on ready state change execute this can anybody explain to me what does it mean on ready state change no it's when you're ready with the answer Async request, async request is what? It's the Ajax object, right? Please repeat with me what is Ajax. Asynchronous, stop right there, what does that mean? Exactly. You're going to say, hey, you go there to the store and bring me a sandwich. And I'm not going to be waiting for you doing nothing. I'm going to be doing other stuff. When you're ready right here with the sandwich, you're going to give me a signal in unready state. Okay? You get it? It's asynchronous. I'm not just sitting here waiting for you to bring me the sandwich. Aha. Uh -huh. So what is process response? Because I'm telling the object, when you're ready... I want you to execute this guy. So guess what? That guy is code. Is JavaScript code. It's not like a five or a boolean. No, it's code. So where is that code? It's this function. But let's not get into that function yet. You are preparing your asynchronous request. You're telling it when you are ready and you come back with the answer, I want you to execute that. But this is what I want you to do for me. I want you to open a connection to the server and I want it to be a GET. Can anybody tell me what other type of connection you can have with a web server? A what? Yes, a PUT is one of them. A GET is another one. What? What's another one? Guys, this is week three. HTML forms. What do you do when you fill out information and inform you? Post it! Post is another action that you can do on a server. In fact, on a web server you can do the CRUDs. The creates, the read, the updates, and the deletes. They are the gets, the puts, the deletes, and the... Can't remember the other one. Okay? But you can do the same. Put get, post, and delete. Yes, I got it. <laughs> All right? It's the CRUDs. It's the same thing that you've been dealing with since you started creating your project. You're going to have to do the CRUDs on your main entity. 
and you're going to learn how to do it with a web server. So, in this case, going back to, okay, a synchronous Ajax object, I want you to open a communication with the server of the get type. And this is the URL that you're going to be using. And yes, I want you to be asynchronous. I'm not going to be waiting for you until you're done with that. Because I have other stuff to do. I have an image to render. I have all kinds of stuff to do in this page. Okay? And then what do you do? You send the guy for the sandwich. Go. Okay? No. And I can't remember what this password... And I can't remember what this... Um parameter is. But guess what? I can find out. Thank God for Google, right? And W3 school. Send. Send a request off to a server. The string only used for post requests. Ah. So when you want to post something, your name, your username, your password, uh, all, like in registration, right? You pass that stuff as a string. Where was I? Okay, so back to analyzing this stuff. And then you send him. You say, okay, you just clicked on simply books. I want you to do this, that, and the other, and I'm not going to wait for you. Go. When the guy comes back with an answer, says, wait a minute, I was told to, when I'm ready, I was told to come back and execute process response. So I'm going to go and look for it, and guess what? It's right here. And it's a huge... JavaScript function. Okay? Because it's going to do a lot of stuff. No. No. Here's the code. You guys seen something like this? Function. Nameless. Please tell me you have. This is what I cover in JavaScript three or four weeks ago. nameless functions tell you what guys there's a whole bunch of video lectures that you guys are now watching that is covering the basics I'm not gonna cover in here because in a two hour lapse time there's not enough time to cover all the basics that you guys need to know that's why I'm publishing video lectures for you to watch them this is the basic stuff that I'm talking about. I do cover these things in the video lectures. I need you to watch them. When you come here, I'm just going to give you the high-level stuff. This is how you do it. This is how I implement it in my Timex web. You guys have to do the same thing. But you have to have all this stuff reviewed. This is what it's called a nameless function. You say function, no name, no parameters, open curly brackets, you put code, close the curly brackets. Guess what? You can do that as a parameter. You can pass it as a parameter, you can save it in a variable. That's the dynamic or yeah, that's the dynamic characteristic of JavaScript. Because it's typeless. In a JavaScript variable, you can put a number, a boolean, a string, code, whatever you want. So another way of doing this will be, hey, a synchronous request, on ready state change, I want you to assign the following code. And all this code that you have in here,
all this code, you will put it here. Wow! Not pretty. Okay? And unfortunately, that's the problem with JavaScript. Did you guys take a look at the jQuery library? Did you try opening and understand it? It was like a whole bunch of code embedded into code, embedded into other function, into other code, and, and it was a mess. Trying to figure out that, it's, it's cumbersome. It's not pretty. But that's the idea. You shouldn't have to, when you download code that works, that you know works, you don't want to be downloading all these different spaces and tabs and whatnot. You just want to load the straight code. The download is going to be faster, right? And your execution on whatever website that you're trying to, it's going to be faster too. So, instead of giving you the code right there, I'm telling you the name of the code. I'm actually giving you a name. And so, it's going to go and find that name in here. That's the function that will execute when it comes back with or without an answer. So, the first thing that I have to question from the guy that came back with my sandwich is, did you find a sandwich? Did you find the store open? Okay? And that's exactly what this guy is doing. Async request. Tell me something. Is the ready state equals 4? What's, what's a ready state equals 4? Can you tell me states? Oops. These are the ready states or possible values of a ready state for an AJAX object. Okay? Zero. What does it mean? The request was done, but it was never initialized. I couldn't complete it. One. Server connection established. That's all about we got. Two. Request received. Okay, so at least the web server received it, right? Three, I'm still processing the request. Leave me alone. Four, the request has finished and the response is ready. So you only care when the ready state is equal to four. Okay? Otherwise, don't bother him. He's trying to get your sandwich. Okay? Now, you mentioned web server codes, Stefan. These are the web servers. That's called a status. Okay? And the status, you were correct, could be 200, which means the server found the document and it's giving it to you. Or 404. Have you guys seen 404 sometimes in a website? It's really bad. That means you ask for a document that doesn't even exist in that server. Okay? And 404 means page not found. I couldn't find it. So, what I want to look for is for status 200. So, if the ready state is equal to 4 and the status is equal to 200 and the response is XML or there is some response, there's some response, right? In this case, it's XML. If, I, if all of these conditions are true, then I'm ready to process whatever I got back. Okay? What if it's not true? Get back. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will show up on your page. There will not be any content on the div ID equals covers. Nothing. It will just stay there. Which is the equivalent of what happens when the guy is still trying to go and find your sandwich. He hasn't arrived. Right? 
or something is wrong with the server. Maybe the server is down. That's possible. The store is closed. Sorry. After a certain amount of time, it will be advisable to put an else so that at least you know that something is wrong. You know, like, I'm sorry, I couldn't get your answer or whatever. Some kind of warning or, 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 or advice. And you will put it under the same div, right? The div with ID covers, you will put that message. So you know, ooh, wait, when something is wrong. Okay? Otherwise, what are we going to do? We found an answer. We finally got an answer, right, from the server. What do we do? We say clear table, and clear table is another function. And all it does, it says document, get me an element by ID, e call covers. This is not jQuery, sorry. Okay? In jQuery, all you would have done is what? In jQuery, what you would have done? Dollar sign, parentheses, double quote, covers, end of, double quote, end of parentheses. jQuery is a simplified version of JavaScript. Guys, you have to know this stuff. But we're doing it in JavaScript. So that means that I'm going to call the document object, and I'm going to tell it to get me an element called covers. And then the inner HTML, that means the inside HTML of that tag, which we know is a what? We know is a div. The inside HTML of that is going to be blank. That's what clear tables means. Put nothing in there. So I'm going to make sure that when an answer comes back, I'm going to clear my table. Then what am I going to do? I'm going to tell my edge objects, okay, give me the response in XML and get me an element by a tag name. And the tag name is going to be cover. Okay. Was my response. You guys see it? This was my response XML. Okay? What am I telling this object to do for me? I'm telling it, hey object, I want you to get that response XML and get elements. Get elements by tag name. What elements? Cover. So this guy is one. This guy is two. This guy is three. Get it? And where am I going to store it? I'm going to store it in a variable called covers. What did I say about JavaScript? Typeless. Covers could be storing a five, could be storing a string, or it could be storing an array. In this case, guess what? Because it's several elements. And then what else? Hey, object, I want you to go into the XML and get me elements by tag base URL. Here it is. There's only one. So you're going to get back an array with how many elements? One. So knowing that, you're going to get that element, first element, right? You're going to get the first child node from that element, and you're going to get the value of it. Guess what's going to go inside base URL? That value. Uh, 
If you didn't have a base URL, then you will get an array. Doesn't matter, it's still an array. You have to reference each element of the array that you want. So in this case, you have to go in for the first one. Right? Now, that first one is this guy. Base URL, right? Who's to tell you that doesn't have more stuff in it? Maybe an anchor, maybe, I don't know, maybe a name, address, and zip code. I don't know. Who's to say that it doesn't have more stuff in it, right? So what do you want? You just want the first child. What's the first child? Hmm? The first child is... Which one? Yeah, exactly. And you just want the value of it. Right? So that's how you get that value into the base URL. Now, where are you going to put the output? The output of everything that came back. Where are you going to put it? In an element inside the document whose name is covers. See, you're preparing all this stuff. That's all you're doing, really. JavaScript is referencing every single one of the elements in the page. And it's calling it by a variable name. So that you can manipulate them. That's all you're doing. That's all JavaScript does. That's all jQuery does. It manipulates all your tags. So that you, you can see dynamic content on your page. So in this case, I'm going to create another element. You see how cool it is? I'm creating an, a table tag right here. This is JavaScript, second or third week. Document, create an element called table. And then document, create an element T body. And then document, create an element t r table row. Look at this. You're actually building the table. This is the JavaScript way of building HTML. Then what do you do? You go into a for loop. And the for loop is going to be covers length. Can anybody tell me what, who is covers? Who's covers? The array. Remember the array that has three elements of three images? This guy. This guy. Covers. Guess what? That array has a length because it's an array. It's an object. So I'm going to go in a for loop from zero to the length minus one. Less than, in other words. And what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to go through each one of them. Get me item sub i and call it cover. Then I say cover, get me the element by name image. What? That's right. Cover has an element called image. Remember, the array was of these guys. All these guys. The array was of all these guys. And those guys are HTML tags that have, I'm sorry, XML tags that have children. So, get me the elements by tag image. And I want you to get me the first one, the first child, the no value. So that's who? That's this guy. This is what it's called parsing an XML. You go down the hierarchy of the XML, picking 
the values that you need from it. Then what do you do? You create another document element TD, that's the table data. And then you create another one called the image. That's the image tag. And then what do you do? You set the attribute of the image tag. What attribute? SRC. You guys remember SRC, right? Please. And what's the SRC going to be equal to? Remember the base URL that you extracted from the XML? Plus the image name. Now the image name, you're going to escape it. What does that mean? What does it mean to escape a string? You've seen file names with dots, underscores, uh, 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 all kinds of characters. They need to be escaped. That means they need to be translated in a way that it will be found in the file system. Okay? So they're being escaped. Then what do you do? You take the image cell, which is the table data, and then you append the child. What child you're appending to it? The image tag. You're actually doing TD inside the TD and IMG closing the TD. That's what you're doing. You're treating your HTML as objects. And that's the advantage of JavaScript. To be able to treat your HTML tags as objects so you can append them, delete them, create them. Then what do you do to the image row? You guys remember who is the image row? Image row is our TR. What do you do? You append that image cell. Then you increment the row count. And this is cool. Look at this. If the row count is equal to 6, what are you going to do? Go to the next line. You don't want to display the whole images over until the... because you're not going to be able to see it in the browser. So you only display 6 at a time. That's how you get... that's how you get... stuff like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Ah! Next row. When the row count is equal to 6, okay, and the covers length, obviously the amount of covers that you need to display is is greater than the i plus 1, and i is the one that I'm at right now in the for loop, right? What am I going to do? I'm going to append a child image row to the table body. And then I'm going to create an element TR. And I'm going to assign that to image row. So basically all I'm doing is doing the slash TR to say this is the end of this table row and creating a new table row. Alright? And then to the table body you append the image row. And then to the image table, you append the table body. What's the total outcome? What's the total outcome of this function? Yes. But you have done that in the output. The final, the final one is output. I want you to append this image table. And who is output? You guys remember who's output? This guy. <coughs> Covers. You're actually appending a child to this div. And the child is a table of images. You guys have to do login using Ajax.